master of wine. Well done. Really, we are really proud you to be a master of wine. Thank you. And then thank you again, because you are trying to promote what is the culture and the knowledge around wine, which I think is the most important thing to have this beautiful, uh, beautiful product from the earth to survive. Then uh, the answer to your question. Yeah, you know, now at this stage that we are ready for the harvest. So we have already started the whites, of course, the reds, some of the earliest variety like the Merlot. It is very important to go in the vineyard to taste the grapes because you have to understand when is the right time to pick the grape. It's, it's just uh, because of the taste that you decide. You know, after years that you measure things like uh, bricks, uh, sugar, alcohol, then what you really need is your, uh, is your taste in the vineyard. So if, you, if this is the answer to your question, what, what is my role now, this is my role, then maybe we go more in details if you want to know which is the role of an agronomist viticulturist in the vineyards to uh, to set the quality high in terms of level then well, we can go on perfect more so it, it's a bit like uh, you know if someone has an apple tree or a pear tree in their garden the apple looks good and there's many apples and you pick one apple and you bite it but it's so malic it's so bitter uh, it's the, you know, the, the ripeness hasn't arrived yet. And so you are assessing the level of sugar and uh, like the sweetness and the right time to pick. So that, that, that makes sense. Um, and then I guess so with regards fine wine, I guess Stefano, the way we would be great to spend this evening is it's quite a, let's say a daunting topic because people think there's wine and then there's fine wine and perhaps it's beyond us, it's untouchable and it's for the elite or let's say, but really, and something, and I probably thought that way myself as well before I joined Naked. And then I remember Rowan just having a very basic and it's probably common knowledge now, but you know, the top Chateau, the top Bordeaux probably shouldn't need to cost more than 20 euros in, in production cost, depending if you own the vineyard, depending on, on how you set up. But that wine might sell for 100 euros or three or 500 euros. And that is brand equity, scarcity, rarity is the difference between 20 euros and 100, 300, 500. So when you go down to what we're doing with you and Poggio de Guardia, the beautiful Poggio de Guardia, um, we basically, we sat down, you have it I saw all over the wall and I loved your video in the warm up <laughs> tour. It was so cool. I enjoyed watching this that. This is my tasting room. All you do is taste Poggio de Guardia. That's nice. But <laughs> well, with Poggio de Guardia, when we set out with this model, and I should say that Stefano, previously you worked with Antonori, who make Tianello, which is one of the Super Tuscans, one of the most famous wines in Italy, Meghan Markle's favorite wine. And uh, that's the only time I will ever name drop a royal or ex royal on here. And uh, Solaya and, and, and top wines. And we, we thought, well, if we give you the funding for the grapes and the barrels and everything in advance, we being angels, they're 20 pounds in advance, we can make a, a Super Tuscan, a fine wine. And so this we sell for around 22, 23 pounds. And Tianello <laughs> is 70 pounds or so. And I guess it was a, it was never a risk, but it was a, okay, let's do it step for us. But you more than delivered. We have done many blind tastings of this versus Tianello. And it, it really genuinely, it has shown so much more purity of fruit. So from your perspective, Stefano, and your experience, how how achievable or how so much, how much in reach is fine wine or is it you know beyond so many people no first of all thank you for asking this i think i think that uh, we shouldn't be scared about a product like wine no it shouldn't be something that it's impossible to to arrive to i think that the communication has really to change around this point it has been like this for, for too many years now. No? Even the, if you think about the communication, no? like 20 years ago, 
30 years ago when I started. I started in 1997. Communication was, uh, was, was bound, was done by only a couple of persons in the world, you know? And they, they, they had an incredible, unbelievable power in de determining what was good or what was and not a good wine. And actually, not in a very uh, equity way, in a very, say, democratic way. You no, know? I'm I'm really happy now we have this tool like like the social media or the the, the base that you've done you now through the naked wine that that everyone can really can really say what they think about the wine. Yes. But then we have a thread there. We have a risk there, and the risk is that. We, uh, we, we mix uh, base wine, approachable wine, entry-level wine with top quality wine. So it shouldn't be something um, that it's impossible to, to arrive to. But of course, we need to have a little bit of, of knowledge more to understand what is behind the wine. So actually, there is a lot of job behind the fine wine. A lot of things we do, starting from the vineyards and in the wineries. And of course, if, if we have the chance tonight, I would like to, to go through a little bit something, some particular things of the, vine, of the winemaking or the vineyard management. So we shouldn't be as scared about knowledge at the end. So from one side, I'm very glad that, that everyone can express their own impression on a wine, but then I also know after more than 20 years that I'm doing this job that you need a bit of education. So if tonight we can add a little bit more of education to the people who are looking, to the angels looking at us, that would be my best uh, time spent together with you because I think, I think we are really doing something uh, that is nice. Also nice and important also to to make this sort of wine survive, because otherwise everything will go slowly down towards the wine that is more easier to understand, approachable, and maybe cheaper no, at the end. So we are trying to, to build up something that it's not so expensive, as you explained, because we, we don't need hundreds of euros to make a fine wine. Uh, as you said, for, for, for 20 euro, you can make whatever you want in terms of grape selection and choosing the best barrels or the best grapes, no? source the best grapes. So, yeah. so I think, I, I really thank you for this because I think it's really important to, to, to share this, uh, this production, which is also very fascinating. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, I guess as, as you touched on, you, we, we, we could go down the route or where you would maybe mix up or cross over those who, let's say, Montepulciano, they love your Montepulciano. And now we're talking about Poggio de Guardia, which is your, your fine wine. And, and, you know, what would give people confidence uh, to aspire to or to, to spend a bit more to, and, and take Poggio de Guardia? And I would also, just before you answer, mention we have got the 2017 vintage coming and after that the 2018 and I've got them both here and I've tasted them side by side and there is a difference in both wines and so th there are things to consider and maybe you could share that with us what what should they what should anyone thinking about who wants to trade up for multiple channel to Poggio think about yeah you see when you when you uh, when you deal with a base wine with an entry level wine <clears throat> you would have a you would have a taste that could perfectly fit your need in terms of use that wine. Like I need a barbecue wine. So you don't need anything particular, just, just a style that you like, that you feel confident with, that, that fits your, uh, your palate. Uh, but this wine can, can be replicated a bit everywhere in the world. So you can find that kind of wine you can find it in Spain, in France, in Italy, in Argentina, no? and, and, and with naked wines, you've really uh, demonstrating this, showing this, that you can really find beautiful wine for an entry level. What, what, 
this kind of wine, in, from my perspective, what they uh, they cannot uh, they cannot um, express to 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 somebody drinking the wine is a unicity a unicity yeah. something that is unique. Yeah. So when you approach a fine wine, what you should what you should look for it's a unique um, a unique impression a unique experience and 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 this has a lot to do what we you what, what you are mentioning about 2017 2018 uh, so the the vintage yeah. uh, when you when you find a wine like uh, my montepulciano for example you shouldn't find a huge difference between each yeah. vintages you no know, each vintage they they should pretty be the same they should stay on that level because once you found something you like you don't want to uh, find something different uh, in a wine like um, poggio di guardia you need to express something else it's it's no it's no more plus I, maybe maybe this is really a bad word it's not a beverage cannot be standardized it's something that has to do more with the relationship that a winemaker creates with his own environment and it has a lot to do with uh, the knowledge he has with his own traditions and uh, knowledge of the history so at the end even even in different uh, vintages you you will find variations that reflects the the, the, the climate for example no you were asking me which are the difference I find in Poggio di Guardia 2017 and in 18. It, it, it's the main thing I can I can tell you immediately now is that 17 has been one of the driest vintage ever in the last 70 years. Wow. And this cannot be reflected into the taste of the wine. It is, it has to. Yeah. And 2018 had a completely different climate. The weather was pretty good for most of the time. So the, 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 the spring went perfectly with the, with the right amount of rain at the right time. So everything is more in, everything is more imbalanced. So yeah. I, I think, I don't know if I've touched the point you want me to touch. No, no, it's perfect. That, that, that's it. Thank you very much, Stefano. It is that you, you allow a little bit more authenticity, a little bit more, uh, Mother Nature just delivering and, and, and in you taking it and also you respecting the site and the vintage and it speaks of a place and it speaks of a time and that is embottled in, in, in a glass and uh, versus the other wines that are, you know, great for pizza and great for barbecue and they're just easy drinking. Here you're trying to sort of write a little bit of history perhaps and, uh, and it tells a story of what happened in the climate in that year and and that actually is and also, and also something very special which i all, always like to remember is that winemaking is a matter of stabilizing stabilizing the taste the, that impression uh, a fine wine should have this taste stable for a long long time this is something that is fascinating a lot for me to to think that that uh, maybe I'm doing a wine now and this will last. Hi Richard. <laughs> Hi Richard. Will last for the for the next uh, 20 or 30 years because this is the this is the length that the wine like Poggio di Guardia is meant to to be to survive and, and to give good impressions. That's it. So it has it has a more a longer life promises a lot more, yeah, going forward. Yeah. Richard Kershaw, big welcome to you, my friend. How are you doing from South Africa? I'm well, I'm well. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. Perfecto. <laughs> Perfecto. Great oh, to have you here, pal. A pleasure. Good to be here, man. Nice one. We, we've just been catching up, chatting about, you know, what specifically defines a fine wine and, 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 um, and where we were at was about, uh, I guess, the difference between a seven ninety nine, like an eight pound or ten pound wine, and a wine at twenty pounds, thirty pounds, is it is speaks of a place and it speaks of a time, i.e., a vintage, 
and that is that is allowed to be reflected and um but also the the attention in the vineyard it, it, you get a bit more concentration and quality it's an expression from the winemaker so you make i would say without any hesitation personally i think some of the greatest chardonnay in the world and that uh, reflects on Burgundy as well, where we have, uh, you know, Prunini Montrachet, Chassin Montrachet and the others. But really, you make mind-bendingly good Chardonnay. And it's a pleasure that we work with you. But you also make uh, Syrah and, and, and other varieties. But Richard, I would be keen to get your view on what, what you're trying to pull out of a vintage on your, to make, that, that would define the Elgin Chardonnay versus the beautiful Cutler Chardonnay. So what makes, what is the point of difference that regards this as say fine wine? Okay, um, sure, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna, I'll turn the background off. Um, okay. <laughs> it clips my ears. So, um, <laughs> so I think the difference um, is, is basically, uh, obviously the, the, the fundamental difference between the two wines is that in Elgin, um, obviously the, the prices of grapes are much higher. Um, it's, it's seen already as a fine wine region. Um, in fact, this morning I was reading some of the new data out and Elgin is the highest or most expensive um, region to buy grapes. But, um, and so clearly the, the riches of in Chardonnay comes out of that. And then um, the Cutler is part of Elgin, but it's actually from outside the region. However, in all fairness, um, the, the rest of the Cape South Coast, one of the grapes is also, um, you know, the second most expensive, even more than Stellenbosch. So, so that would be a, a, a smaller a feature. But in terms of the actual uh, way we're making the wines, I think that the, um, the, the thing with the Elgin uh, grapes, um, although we do it with all of them, we, <clears throat> we're working with um, particular vineyards that are um, high quality vineyards. They're not necessarily old vineyards because Elgin doesn't necessarily have anything older than about, uh, well, 91 to be fair, but even those vineyards are, are not in great, great nick because the clones we, we could get weren't, weren't great in those days, but um, they're certainly uh, not old. But what we do is that we do have a lot of young vineyards and for the younger vineyards, when I talk young, less than well, between five and say eight years, that, those we would we don't use in the in the Elgin range at all. Um, those are those are as, that we would we would use those in the Cutler. So going back to the, the point that I slightly uh, heard was was that they wouldn't have clearly the concentration, but what they do get um, one forgets young vines give huge amounts of fruit, um, and they can be extremely attractive, light, uh, obviously very little structure, but very light ethereal wines, which can dance in the mouth, but not necessarily are wines you would keep for, for a period of time. They, they, are, they are hugely enjoyable, but, but yeah, not, 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 not with a phenolic structure. So that would be uh, an aspect um, for, for, for the cut of Chardonnay. Secondly, um, or thirdly, uh, because we buy from outside, the, um, the way that we make the wines is, is clearly different. Um, we, we have to, uh, with, with the Elgin fruit, we are very particular about how we ferment each block, how we ferment, and uh, not just each block, but each, each stub block. So if you think of a parcel of grapevines in which there are, say, several clones, and, and obviously a lot of the angels are familiar with my clonal rant, rants or talks, discussions, is that the uh, different clones, I like to try and understand them. So we we pick the block individually. So if there's say three clones, we will pick them individually to understand them better. And um, that, that's, that's an important aspect of what we're trying to do. Outside of Elgin, we do actually try the same thing. Even, you know, even with a cutler, it's, it's not, not about that always. But we, we do is, um, it, it is, I'm not saying it's less relevant, but it's just interesting to do it. And, and it will come on to a fourth point that I'm going to mention. But with, with, with doing it with the Elgin fruit, it's important because we understand um, the soils with the clones and how they react. And also what we do is we, we can understand how they work with the, the barrels that they're gonna be put into. Um, because clearly that's an important thing. And we actually use an algorithm that actually works out from, from what we've done in the past, what we can do with a certain clone. So for example- Amazing. <laughs> yeah, go, 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 please. Um, 
yeah but um so just to kind of give an example um when you when you have the, the richard Dawkins shot you're going to have in it a shot let's say a clone 76 okay clone 76 is quite light it's ethereal it tends to give you a a lovely floral fragrance a lovely lift intensity um but generally uh it, it's quite an it's it's kind of more about the the impression on the attack um if it's on a sandstone soil it will give it again further enhancement and lift and lightness um it can give a little bit of alcohol because on those sandy soils in the warmer years you're going to have a little bit more um you know a little bit more trouble with the with the ripening you're going to have a little bit more richness but in the wetter years actually uh, ripens extremely well um uh, in the sense that it ripens without getting the alcoholic kick so with that you're going to use quite a lot of um quite a little bit of new wood but not a lot and we will use certain coopers that enhance the aromatics um for, for us um and Safana would know the coopers but we use actually Lua Latour and Adwa which accentuate that lift and then we use a lot of second fill wood so in that batch we would say have 10 percent new wood and the rest would be second fill Another clone, 95, which has breadth to it, it has richness, has a lot of stone fruit characters, um, very attractive clone, especially in its youth, grown on, say, a shale soil, which has already structural components of big depth density. There, we will actually give it maybe 40% new oak, and we will use more tremolo, more chassan um, style oaking, where there's a bit more power, a bit more to, to hold the fruit, Kind of because you want the fruit you want the barrel to act as a belt not not to overpower it um we used to use a lot more francois frere but, but i find that quite a little bit overpowering it's a bit belt and braces these are all, these are all names of all in france that that take from different forests and make it in a different way the barrel the barrel cooperages. and importantly the different cooperages do different toasting levels and that's a, a feature um even if they call it the same toast and so those wines will have a lot of new wood and, and quite a lot of third fill wood um, and less second fill. So those are treated differently. And we can work that out batch by batch um, because we've also have 95 on sandstone and 90 and we have 96 and five quite. These are very boring names and I apologize immediately to everyone. That they have no, you know, the people who made these names up had no real connotation of um, sort of you know marketing communication um, exactly yes and and I, and I should just say at this point to anyone who's watching us on zoom and on facebook and a, a massive welcome to those that are tuning in and hopefully not dropping out but this is our sort of carte blanche uh, to go a little bit geeky and a little bit sort of deeper on wine and there are there were uh, tastings uh, zoomed uh, one hour before and uh, johan and renan will be on us from with us from south africa later and we go on all week this we uh, we are unap unapologetic in our geekiness, but stick with us because these little bits will uh, you 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 nod off and then you'll have a sip and you'll wake up. But uh, it it's it's good stuff deep down. But the main thing to know is that I'm surrounded by Stefano and Richard, who are top class winemakers. And what we really want to do is just share why it's passion and, it, and, 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 and why we care about these little things that may not have been on your horizon before. So Richard, you then you've put together, you've worked your algorithm and you've, you've understood the site and the clone and the barrel. And then I assume you, it's blending or there's the ferment and the time. So again, what we, what we tend to do, and again, I think talking about fine wine is that we, we do everything um, we can naturally, a natural ferment, um, which has a certain risk inherent in its, in its feature because it may not um, completely ferment all the sugars. Um, so that's important because um, I find that, that the natural fermentation gives a little bit more complexity. Um, and the fermentation as opposed to an unnatural fermentation is just to clarify. So what, what you do is um, with, a, with a natural fermentation, you allow the juice to go through a, um, uh, to, to allow, to, it, it starts spontaneously without adding any not, a yeast. So generally just to kind of, maybe, maybe I should step back for, for a minute. If you take a juice, you generally would bring it into your winery um, or rather you'd bring in the grapes clearly and then you would press it and 
um, it would be a, it would be a, um, what's called a dirty juice or a, um, you know, it would be a, a clarified, yeah, clarified, and you would possibly settle that juice, allow that to um, become clarified. You might use some maybe an enzyme to allow that to, to clarify better, and then you would take that juice and you would add a, you would rack it, or well, decant it is the better term, um, and you would then put a. Um, you would make up a yeast which your local company has given you, or you bought. Sorry, you bought rather. Um, in and a package. You buy the yeast in a in a package. Yeah. And you basically make it up. You you rehydrate it, and then you put that into the um, uh, into the wine. Now it's important because I don't want to disregard that the, what they do because there's a lot of yeasts that add certain characters in the sense or promote certain characters in the wine, they, they work with certain um, enzymes or flavor, flavonoids, I suppose, to release them or convert them, which allows um, the wine to, to perhaps express certain uh, parameters that you're after. Um, for example, Sauvignon Blanc, you would tend to find gives, um, you can have a certain yeast that will convert certain thiols and also release certain thiols. Thiols being- Layer the, compounds, yeah, flavors, yeah. And, and they're actually extremely useful and extremely good. They, they work effectively um, for that. However, the thing is they tend to do that as a job, um, which is in a, in a way when you're wanting, you know, you could argue a sort of more easy drinking wine. You want to have a certain parameters, you know, you, which, you, which are, you're after. With a, a natural yeast, um, you, are, you are not bound by those parameters. You are gonna have all sorts of interactions some um, some may not be a good thing, but generally you work on the principle that you're going to um, make sure your um, must is in a good state. Clearly, you don't want rotten grapes. Um, you want to have a, uh, a juice, but but un unlike the clear juice, we we don't use it. We use a, um, a, a dirty juice. So you have all the solids. You don't settle the juice. You have all the solids. Now that is a much riskier uh, proposition because. Your, your, your ferment can actually uh, run away with you um, it, in certain varieties, but, but with Chardonnay, um, I don't mind that because it's in a, in a barrel. And importantly, um, to me, the natural or spontaneous ferment, there's lots of, lots of different yeasts, and those yeasts all have different, unlock different enzymes, which are flavor. And the flavors create uh, complexity in the, in the wine. And we don't know every year what they're going to create, but generally they always work on, um, they, they work extremely well. And um, we, we don't know enough about natural fermentation. Uh, we know the negatives clearly because it could unlock undesirable characters, um, volatile characters, possibly um, uh, other, other issues. But generally, if you get it right, you can actually unlock a lot more things than, than if you inoculate it. So I guess, Richard, to, to, to summarize on that point, and, and before we move on, you could say that it's sort of, if you're an accountant, it, it is a risk mitigation process in terms of, if we do this, it comes with challenges, but the return on investment could be fantastic, and you will really taste it and layer it, and it's unique and it's special, but in order to get that quality, you have to do things that require an element of risk, but it returns, it rewards, or you could blow the whole thing up. And so, so that is what people are sort of, they're paying for the risk that you endured, but you're an expert, you're a master of wine and you're a quality winemaker. You've done it before. You've got an algorithm. When has an algorithm ever told us something that we didn't need to know? Netflix delivers most of the time. And so I guess I, I think for uh, just to bring it back to the fine wine, you, you've shared with us an element that you experienced in making Chardonnay the risks and the, the, the considerations. I, I would just say then, Richard and Stefano, and just before you joined Richard, we were talking about, I think Stefano, you were saying, you're looking to make a wine that would age, that would be here longer, that would go on further than your multiple General d'Abruzzo, it would go on in 10 years, 15 or 20 years. And what I'd be interested to know from everyone who's watching, we've got many people on Zoom, we've got some people on, plenty of people on Facebook and Instagram as well, if we maybe we ran a poll, just a questionnaire to ask, has anyone laid down wines before? So bought wine maybe for 
uh, a child of their own, maybe for a godson or goddaughter, or just as, as a gift. Uh, so something that, you know, you buy now, and then when they're 21 or 18, that they, they'll then reap the re rewards. It, it is something that is on the periphery of my understanding of the fine wine. Um, I didn't have it. It was, it's fine. There's no regrets. But I, I used to live with a guy in Dublin. And um, when I was getting into wine, and he was from England, and we were living together in Dublin, and he told me, um, what was the name? Uh, Calon Segur. So it's a third growth chateau, I think third or fourth growth chateau. And he says, oh, yeah, you know, my godfather used to, he bought me six magnums of my birth year, Chateau Calon Segur. And I was like, and he goes, I, I just persuaded him to go back to England and to bring two of them back to Dublin. And we drank them in the same night. And um, yeah, so I, I sort of tapped into his inheritance. So I would be, there's a, there's a poll up on your screen there. If, um, if you could just take a, a moment and if you want to answer, do. If not, I'm sure there's a way to, or it will go away soon. But um, in addition, while people are having a think about that, completing it, and we'll see some results on screen shortly. Um, Stefano. It's, it's harvest and you're in the Northern Hemisphere, Richard, you're in the Southern Hemisphere, winter there and frost risk. But Stefano, you're, you've given up your time this evening. I'm very grateful because you're as a consultant winemaker, you're also darting around from winery to winery. But we've been in discussion about the Fine Wine Club uh, uh, at Naked Wines, which we started two years ago. And I think, I may be mistaken, but I think both of you, uh, we'll just jump quickly and acknowledge these results. So 75%, the vast majority, it hadn't crossed the mind to lay down wine for that. And I'd be in the same, although I did do it for my son, but that's because I'm a wine geek and a bit closer to it. But prior to wine and working on wine, it had not crossed my mind. And it's interesting to see 9% of people saying, what the hell are you talking about, man? Uh, so, but thank you for voting. Um, it's interesting to hear all your thoughts. You might consider it now, but um, Stefano, we, we, we launched this fine wine club two years ago at Naked Wines. It's been pretty on the down low. We haven't communicated it greatly, mainly because we just wanted to understand how it would go, who would be interested, where, could we do it properly? And I think in the first case we released, of which there were four bottles, not six bottles, there was Poggio de Guardia and there was Elgin Chardonnay. And if, if it wasn't the first, they were sort of two apart. And so as testament to, well, uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan um, yeah, of, of both of y'all. So, and now we've come up for air and we've seen that the Fine Wine Club is, is great and, and has uh, great potential. And so what we've been able to do uh, is commission winemakers, uh, naked winemakers. It's the past uh, editions have been made up of some sort of in and out, you know, people we wouldn't have continued with just to explore. The wines have always been delicious, but there wasn't a sort of a long-term plan with them. But I, I was able to write a sort of a wish list for Northern Hemisphere, because as we go into now, it's harvest time in, in, in Europe and uh, North America, which wines do I believe would succeed in a fine wine club? And that would be that they, we wouldn't see them. We'd pick them 2020 and we might see them in late 21, late 2022. And your wine today, which we've been talking about, you and I, January, 2023. So we are, that's the way, that's the sort of uh, area we're talking about. So would you mind telling angels who are watching what the hell we were talking about past few weeks and then today by email we're like yeah it sounds good let's go what what are you planning yeah yeah we we are, we are starting now uh, the harvest uh, actually it will be on saturday next saturday we will harvest a specific plot so just a small vineyard of merlot it's a merlot that it's on the coast and so it's in the suvereto area we are in tuscany so near the seaside Okay. And there it's a land, yeah, it's on the, on the west coast mm -hmm. and of Italy, central part of Italy. And, and that area is particularly famous for very, very good uh, Merlot, 100% Merlot uh, wines. Um, maybe the most famous is Masseto, made from Ornellaia. But then there is uh, uh, Tuarita Redigafi, which are wines that are famous worldwide 
So, so I could find, as you said, because I travel most of the vineyards as a consultant, so everywhere, a little bit everywhere in Italy, but specifically more in Tuscany. So I was able to find a vineyard that is at Subereto. So it's a very, very beautiful site, beautiful uh, red soil. So we are harvesting these grapes now on, on, uh, on Saturday. And I would like to explain to, to the angels what will be the, the process to arrive to January 2023, as you said, no? that it will be probably the release of this wine. So we will harvest next Saturday and then the maceration. So the maceration is the, is the contact between the juice and the skin in the fermenting tank. It will last, um, and here again, like Richard says, so it's just a matter of understanding the complexity and the, all the, the factors that are interacting with all with the other. So it will last a couple of weeks, three weeks maximum. After these three weeks, we will press the, 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 the grapes. So we will take the, what we call the free run of the juice of the wine, it has fermented already after these three weeks. And then uh, we will put into, um, in, in this case, we are going to use not, not uh, 200 liters barrels, but we are using a size that is slightly bigger, so 500 liters, what we call tonneau. Uh, and uh, here, the wine will have a secondary fermentation, what we call the malolactic fermentation, so the conversion of malic acid into lactic acid that will make the wine a little bit softer. And then after this, we will wreck several times the wine. The wine will probably stay in, the, in, this, in these barrels uh, for about one and a half year. And uh, after this one and a half and year... Just to, note, just to put it into context, sorry to interrupt yep. you, your Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, 2019 vintage, how long would that stay in barrel or would it even be in barrel? Or It, 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 will, uh, it will have just a little bit, like 10% of the wine into barrels, but it is stainless steel fermented and it, is, uh, it stays in, in stainless steel. Yeah. And it is bottled, you know, uh, 19 uh, fermented in September, October is bottled in March of the next year. So it's, Young and wine. it's already, it's, it's available now on the market. No? While this wine will stay one and a half year in the barrels. And then after this will be wrecked and then filtered, clarified, and then bottled and at, at least one year in the bottle. So that's why it takes a long way to be ready. And yeah, all this process. And, yeah. and, and that, the, what, just for people, we will move on to, uh, let's do this briefly about time in bottle. And then there are a number of questions in the Q&A and we have got 10 minutes left. And it would be really great if we could rattle through, you know, back for Richard and Stefano to answer these questions. But I think aging wine is, is a key question. It may even be in there in the question. So you, are, are going to do you're going to give us one year in bottle of aging so we don't have to do it or the customer doesn't have to do it uh what what are you trying to achieve the Montepulciano d'Abruzzo you made it in September we're drinking it in March that's six months but here we're going to you're going to release it three years after it's been made one year has been in bottle what's happening in bottle and why does it need that and what more does it need yeah, of course, the one year in bottle is the minimum uh, to, to, to have this wine uh, ready uh, to, 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 be, to be drunk. But, but at the end, what we, what we are trying to do with the bottle is to make the wine to be softer, having more volume and, mm -hmm. and, and being more smooth. Uh, because, of course, once you want to make a wine that has to last for such a long time, you need to have something that we call structure, that you also understand structure, that is made by, by tannins. Tannins are, have, have this astringency, so they, they give a, a dryness sticky, yeah, in the mouth. So, mm -hmm. so of course, you want to, to balance this and, and you need time in the bottle, that is why. And, and by time, by this process of aging in bottle, all the stringency will be a lot reduced. 
Very good. Okay, so it, I think the words polymerize, the, they, they, they all sort of click together, the tannin structures come together and they become this sort of uh, malleable, supple mouthfeel. Very good. So Richard and Stefano, I'm gonna have a quick look in the Q&A and I will do my very best to respond to as many as possible. Um, I think this is I think this is a, it's a tricky, but it's a great question. It comes from Gordon Barber. It was one of the first in. How do you define fine wine from other great wines? So I think as we were sort of touched on before, Richard, your your cutler. We may have covered this in bits and pieces along the way because it was my intention to sort of separate the two. But you talked to us about cutler and then Elgin and just sight. Yeah. Um. So with regards to, I mean, the, the big difference, and I think this is the most, uh, how can I put it? It's a very challenging um, situation because I think that um, fine wine, is, it's a difficult one to say. Fine, fine implies that it's just a much better wine. But in fact, the point is, it's all about differences. Um, I've always assumed, it's, it's a bit like saying, if you, I, I don't mean to be blunt, but it's like going to a, a steakhouse and ordering steak. And that is a simple, delicious meal that you're going to enjoy, but you don't want to have it every night. At the same time, I don't particularly want to go to the Fat Duck or the Old Al Bully every night either. I will enjoy it for the night I'm there. But the point being is that they are satisfying different, different needs for the, for the consumer. So for me, what is the difference? Like the cut of Chardonnay, um, I sort of slightly, I didn't really allude enough, but we, we're not using, for example, as much oak. We are using younger vines to, to promote the fruit. Um, we're leaving it, it, it's a shorter vatting period. So there's less of what we call, um, okay, I'm gonna get geeky, but something called manoprotein release, which is the release of certain uh, characters that give you what we call oatmeal and oat bran, but, but complexity. But Good. we're trying to bottle it prior to that to in, in, involve the fruit as its primary aspect. So when, the, the consumer is drinking that when you know when I'm drinking it or the angels they are looking at it from the perspective that it's got a plenty of fruit and it's going to be immediately available for the for the palate it's going to be enjoyable and delicious yeah. immediately released. that's the primary end it's hard don't forget to make wines like that as well it's not I mean I think we often assume that fine wine is much harder to make but it's it requires a certain understanding of what you've got in your barrels, what you've got in your eggs. We use a lot of eggs for the cutler and what you've got in your vineyards. You know, I, I try a lot of wines which are made in a, in a more tannic or extracted way that Stefano alluded to that are released on the market too young and they're terrible wines. They are not easy drinking wines at all um, because they are just not made for that market. And unfortunately, they are made badly. But a fine wine in terms of a wine that is going to offer more complexity, and again, as Stefano referred to, it's going to offer more extract, possibly, and tannin, and wood, and oak, and, and lots of things going on. But it needs time to assimilate, to polymerize in barrel, in sorry, in bottle, um, and importantly, not just assimilate in bottle or, or polymerize, it's going to get better. Mm. And I, the big thing is with, with fine wine is, the, is that it's a delicious wine to drink in its youth, but it's not actually at its best. It's a little awkward, a little closed. It needs decanting, possibly. The idea is that it's going to evolve into something much better. And, and, and show different personalities, year three, year five, year 10, year 15. And that's it. So if you bought six or you bought 12, you're watching this thing grow up and you're following its development and it's intriguing, yeah. And, and I think that that is, that is your fun, that's the fundamental difference. It's, it's, being able to produce a wine like that because if you are you're going to possibly use more aspects perhaps it's going to have more tannins or it may have more time in oak it's going to have mono proteins it's going to be a much more complicated wine to understand it's going to be very complex which means that and, and just a kind of a, a great I, I remember meeting a bordeaux house and it's and yes i suddenly noted i've got very little wine here but sorry we've finished the bottle <laughs> I, I got you i got you richard yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us, yeah. Complexity is a bit of a I go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Complexity is about smelling it and going, oh, I don't know what that is. Um, it's a bit of this and a bit of that. And you you smell it again and again, you get 
different things. That the wine writers of the world write extensive notes on the wine because they just can't pinpoint what it is. With a more accessible wine that's easy, you're going to pick up, you know, the blackberries or the black currants and the reds or the peach and the, and the lemons and the white because they are there to pick up to enjoy. It isn't to test one's uh, mind. You are, you are enjoying it on the, on the patio uh, as the sun is going down or, or whatever it is. You are a different type of imbibing. Um, and I think that's the critical feature. Um, it's also possibly a wine that you're going to drink without food because you're going to enjoy its fruitness fruit or fruity characters, whereas the fine wine is probably going to actually show, actually be complementary to your to your dinner. I, I, um, that, that's an interesting point, and uh, and we, we have only a few minutes left, but I would uh, constructively almost challenge that because I, when I open a great bottle of wine, I don't need any char grilled smoky garlic not nothing in the way i just want purest what's going on in the wine so i would drink the sort of easier stuff with food but we're all different it's just palettes just it's just freaky quirks so uh but i so what i would say is sometimes you can have food and and and, and general basic wine and then you you get to experience the purity of fine wine on its own or with a great meal that you've been looking forward to having everyone around um, just in the interest of time, I wanted to just remember to mention to you that the Fine Wine Club that I was talking about, uh, which we've been keeping on, just we just haven't felt the need to promote it or talk about it, that is now live. If anyone wanted to check it out, I think there should be a link maybe in the Q&A or it should come up somewhere where you'll be able to click through and, and see. And it's basically six wines, six different bottles of wines every quarter we go march july october december and um the case is 99 quid and everything has been you know vetted a number of times and the wines are bloody brilliant they're bloody beautiful it's a bit of a step off the beaten track but uh i guess you know if, if we continue to deliver beautiful cutler chardonnay and beautiful multiple Chiano, we're then allowed to have a little bit of fun at the top where we sort of introduce things from vineyards you wouldn't expect countries regions you wouldn't expect and maybe we don't go on to work with that winemaker again but they're very happy to sell us the number of bottles required for the club and we are very happy to ex have this little experience so um yeah uh, have a look at that and if you don't like the wine you get your money back so what am I even talking about? I might sign up again. Um, it has come too soon to the end of our session. We, we, we wrap up these, these sessions at uh, 8.50. But um, guys, I really appreciate you both coming on and showing two different aspects. Richard, I, I bow down to your Chardonnay. As you know, in lockdown, I, uh, yes, I, I direct ordered because I needed a, <laughs> a hit. And, and, and it was incredible. I drank that on, on a special day a couple of weeks ago and it was mind-bendingly beautiful. And Stefano, your time in the middle of harvest is, is, is very generous. And just to put a comment, I think, I don't know that I send the, the feedback, but I was tasting 2017. It's got a bit more of that structure. I opened 2018. And to talk about, as you, as you were both saying, mouthfeel, roundness, depth, and I found a sort of a spice, clove spice from the oak and pepper spice, strangely, uh, in addition in the 18, which I didn't see in the 17. And it's just incredible. And it basically it makes you think it's layered and it's breadth and depth. And it is different from multiple Chiano, which is number one, but it is just something different. And it's a bit of an experience. It's sort of a ethereal, holistic, like you just, you just drink it and you, you're, you're living something different. And it's great. And you, like you said, Richard, you don't do that often. If you ate out in five star or mich three Michelin star restaurants all the time, you know, you'd be throwing food across the other side of the restaurant. So guys, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your time. And anyone who's still sitting, drinking, you're allowed to have a comfort break, but we'll be back on in 10 minutes with Johan Kruger and Renan Boorman, your neighbours, Richard, uh, the good old boys from South Africa, and they'll be back on yeah, at nine o'clock. Thank you very much, guys. I appreciate your time. Really Ciao big time. Ciao. 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 See you, Richard. Bye-bye.